Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the Wittig reaction named after Georg Wittig, who got 1979 Nobel Prize in chemistry for it. And this reaction is probably one of the most important carbon-carbon double bond formation reactions that you're going to cover in your class. You are going to see that in your homework, you are going to see it on the synthesis problems, and you are definitely going to see it on the test. So, let's take a close look at this reaction and talk about everything you need to know about it for the test. In broad strokes, the Wittig reaction is a reaction between a carbonyl, which can be either aldehyde or a ketone, and a phosphoelid, which sometimes we refer to as the Wittig elid. As a result of this reaction, we are going to get an alkene, and stereochemistry-wise, this alkene can be either E or Z, depending on the nature of our starting materials and how we do this reaction. On top of that, we are also going to get the triphenylphosphine oxide, which is going to be our co-product, it is a waste product, but we are still going to mention that because that is an important part in the mechanism of this reaction. Talking of which, the mechanism of the Wittig reaction is going to be a two-phase process. The first part is going to be the formation of the phosphoelid, or just elid. We are going to start with some sort of alkyl halide. Let's say we are going to start with a butyl bromide over here, a primary alkyl halide. And typically we are going to see primary alkyl halides in this reaction. Then we are going to react that with triphenylphosphine. And triphenylphosphine is an excellent nucleophile. We have have an electron pair on the phosphorus, and that electron pair on the phosphorus can do an SN2 attack on our alkyl halide, displacing the bromine and making the corresponding new carbon-phosphorus bond. And since this is an SN2 reaction, we are going to be somewhat sensitive towards steric hindrances. So if you are going to do this reaction with a primary alkyl halide, typically we are not going to have any troubles. But as soon as we start going into something a little bit more substituted, let's say we take a secondary alkyl halide, the reaction is not going to be as smooth anymore. And of course, when it comes to tertiary alkyl halides, that's going to pretty much be a dead end and we are not really going to get any appreciable quantity of our salt. But the salt here is not our final product, that's not quite our elid yet. In order to get the elid, we need to get rid of the proton here. And we are specifically going to be targeting one of these two protons that are sitting right next to our phosphorus. In order to pull one of those guys off, we are going to use a very strong base. And typically, that strong base is going to be butyl lithium. However, that's not the only base that you are going to see in this reaction. Occasionally, we can see other strong bases such as sodium or potassium hydride, or maybe even something like LDA. But I'll use uh, butyl lithium here as the most classic base that we typically see in reactions like that. So butyl lithium is going to come in and pull this proton off, which is going to give us our phosphoelid that looks like this. We can also show the resonance structure for this phosphoelid when we are going to take the pi bond and move those electrons towards the carbon. So you could potentially draw your elid with the double bond like this one, or with a plus minus charge, like what I have on the right side. Whichever I choose doesn't matter, both of those are correct, and different instructors prefer different form of this elid, so pay close attention to whichever structure your instructor likes to do in class, and just go with whichever structure they like to, you know, show. The important thing here, however, is to keep in mind that the phosphoelid that we have just formed here, that one is going to be a pretty good nucleophile. Which means that if we bring it into a contact with an electrophile, such as a carbonyl compound, like an aldehyde or a ketone, these guys can react with each other. Which brings me to the next part of this reaction, which is going to be the reaction with the carbonyl compound. Here, for my carbonyl, I'm going to use butanol, which looks like this. So I'm going to take my butanol and I'm going to take my phosphoelid, which I'm going to draw like this with the charges, and the first step here is going to be the nucleophilic attack from my negatively charged carbon onto my carbonyl, which pushes electrons onto the oxygen and makes a new carbon-carbon bond between this carbon and this carbon, giving me an intermediate that looks like this. This version of the mechanism is what we refer to as the classic version of the Wittig reaction, where we do form the betaine. Uh, we also have another version of this mechanism where the betaine is not formed, and I'll talk 
about that in just a moment, but for right now, let's look at our betaine. Betaine is a twitter ionic compound, meaning that it has a plus and a negative charge. And by its nature, the betaine is not particularly stable. So what's going to happen here is a very rapid cyclization where the oxygen is going to react with phosphorus, ending up with a four-membered ring, looking like this. This intermediate is commonly called oxyphosphatane, and as you can imagine, a four-membered ring is not particularly stable either. So what we're going to see in this case is a spontaneous decomposition of our oxyphosphatane, where the electrons going to go towards the phosphorus-oxygen double bond from one side and towards the carbon-carbon bond from the other side. Essentially, what that does it's going to break this bond and this bond and make an additional bond over here and over here, giving me my alkene and triphenylphosphine oxide as my co-product. And I've mentioned a moment ago that the formation of the triphenylphosphine oxide here is important because the formation of this guy over here is essentially the driving force for the last step. The thing is, the oxygen-phosphorus double bond that we have over here is in incredibly thermodynamically stable, and because of that, it is so much more favorable to form that PO double bond that our four-membered ring, our oxyphosphatine, just spontaneously breaks apart. So this is the mechanism that is typically going to be expected from you on the exam and the homework, and this is the uh, mechanism that the majority of the instructors are going to be showing to you. However, as I've mentioned, there is an alternative mechanism that bypasses the formation of the betaine. And in that, what I like to call an alternative mechanism, we are going to start with the carbonyl, just like in the last case. We are going to react it with our elid, again, just like in the last case. But instead of making a betaine, we are going to make in the same step bonds between our carbons and bond between the oxygen and the phosphorus, giving you the oxyphosphatane intermediate right away, which, just like in the previous case, going to undergo the spontaneous decomposition, giving us our products, an alkene and triphenylphosphine oxide, which is our waste product. And you might have a very reasonable question. Which mechanism is correct here? And the answer, unfortunately, is, well, both. The thing is, when it comes to the formation of the betaine, betaines by themselves are not particularly stable and they need to be stabilized somehow. That is typically going to happen if you have lithium salts present, if the base that you use to form your elid is some lithium-containing salt like butyl lithium or LDA or something of that sort. If we are using a salt-free elid and we don't have lithium salts in the system, the chances are we are not going to be seeing the formation of the betaine, and we're going to go with the oxyphosphatane formation right away via this alternative mechanism, which, by the way, sometimes we refer to as a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction. Anyways, when it comes to the sophomore organic chemistry, typically what I see is that instructors are going to give you one version or the other, and that's what they're going to be expecting on the exam. So pay attention to what your instructor does in class and go with that mechanism. If your instructor draws the betaine, which is very likely, then draw the betaine. If your instructor bypasses the betaine and draws oxyphosphatane right away, well, do the mechanism like that, because as I always say, Ultimately, it's your instructor who is going to be giving you the final grade, and once you are done with your course, then we can sit down with a cup of tea and discuss the intricacies of this mechanism till our heart is content. But until then, do whatever your instructor is doing in class, because, as I said, they're going to be giving you a final grade. Now, I keep on talking about the different types of elids all the time, and that's for a reason. When it comes to our elids, we are going to break them into two major categories. And those categories are going to be stabilized elids, which have electron withdrawing groups, something like this, where this guy over here, carbonyl, that is going to be our electron withdrawing group. And your typical electron withdrawing groups are going to be things like carbonyls, like aldehydes or ketones, or maybe esters, or other groups that can pull the electron density towards themselves and stabilize the negative charge on the carbon via the resonance. Because if I take the example that I have here on the screen right now, and I draw another resonance contributor for that molecule, where I take the double bond between phosphorus 
phosphorus and carbon and move those electrons onto the carbon like that, I'm going to end up with a resonance contributor that looks like this. And in this case, we can use our electron withdrawing group to pull the electron density towards itself and stabilize that negative charge, giving us the following resonance contributor. And the cool part about the stabilized elids is they are stable enough that most of them can be stored for long periods of time. Funny enough, I worked with one elid one time, it was actually this exact elid that was almost 30 years old when I took it from the shelf and that elid still worked. I was kind of amazed with that. Anyways, stabilized elites, they are not that super reactive and they are pretty stable. They react uh, with our aldehydes and ketones kind of slow, but they still do that and they are going to be stable enough so that we can keep them on the shelf. But another important feature about the stabilized elites is the stereochemistry of the product. The thing is, when we have a stabilized elite, that will typically give us an E alkene. So for instance, instance, if I took my stabilized elid, this guy, and I reacted with some sort of a carbonyl, let's say we're going to do a reaction with benzaldehyde here, the major product here is going to be a double bond, and the double bond is going to have the E configuration. So my final product will look something like that. The z stereo configuration for the other diastereomer here is possible, and it is going to be a minor product, but the major product that we are going to expect in this reaction is going to be the E isomer. And the other type of elid that we are going to have, the other classification, is going to be non-stabilized elids. And those guys, they do not have electron withdrawing groups, so nothing stabilizes the negative charge on our carbon. An example would be something like uh, what we have seen already previously, where I have a simple butyl group connected to my triphenylphosphine. So that would be an example of a non-stabilized elid. And the important feature of the non-stabilized elids from the perspective of the stereochemistry is that these guys tend to give the Z alkenes. So if I do a similar reaction to what I have uh, right above, I take my non-stabilized E lead and I react it with my benzaldehyde, the major product in this case is going to be the Z alkene, where the two groups that I have my phenyl group and my propyl group in this case, they are on the same side of my molecule. Now, this stereoselectivity is not set in stone and it is not absolute either. So it's more appropriate to probably say that I'm going to have the major E or major Z stereoisomer depending on the reaction. Um, and while the stereoselectivity is here is not absolute, we typically are going to expect a pretty good one, maybe 80 to 20 split or even better depending on the nature of our actual reagents. And of course, the Wittig reaction is old enough and there are plenty of modifications to the Wittig reaction that can change the stereoselectivity and the overall outcome of our reaction as well. However, we typically do not cover those uh, modifications in an introductory organic chemistry course, so you are not likely to see those fancy Wittig versions in your course. But if you do, I'll talk about those in another tutorial. And in the next video, we are going to go through a few Wittig reaction examples and I'm going to show you a nifty trick how you can predict the product of the Wittig reaction easily without having to draw the mechanism every single time. So make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that one. And of course, as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, you can tell me that by hitting the like button and leaving me a comment below. Watch this video next and I'll see you next time.